Hi, everybody. My name is Inga Cotton. I'm the founder and executive director of San Antonio Charter Moms. And these are Charter Moms Cats. And we've been going live to help families get the information they need so their kids can keep learning in spite of all the disruptions of the pandemic. And uh, I'm so excited today. There's a new post on the blog about learning styles and why learning styles, even though they sound great, they are, in fact, a myth. But there are better ways to connect with students. And the uh, author of that post is uh, Mary Field who's the head of school at the International School of San Antonio. And she's our guest uh, to explain more about like why learning styles are so appealing, why the myth is so persistent, um, how it's been disproven and what we should be thinking about instead. So um, Mary, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm glad to be here. Um, so first of all, um, I think most people have heard of learning styles, but just in case they haven't, or maybe they, um, you know, haven't heard it lately. Can you explain what learning styles are? And along the way, we'll probably realize, like, oh, that sounds that sounds so wonderful. It must be true, right? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that's a good question um, because I think that's sort of like, you know, part of what I, you know I wanted to talk about is that um, you know this sort of like idea of learning styles. Um, you know, it is sort of like nailing jelly to the tree because some models, like the ones I think people are most familiar with, they'll have sort of four, three or four categories. They'll either put a learner into the category of a visual learner, an auditory learner, or a kinesthetic learner. So that's like the capitalized V-A-K, or sometimes they throw an R in there for reading and writing, the VARC model. Uh, but all in all, if you sort of, you know, survey and make it a tick mark for every learning style that's identified, you'll get uh, north of 70. So most people, I think, if you just like went to HEB and started tapping people on the shoulder and be like, hey, so have you heard of learning styles and what's your learning style? I think most people would say something like, oh, yes, I know what you're talking about. I think I'm a visual learner. Or, you know, my child is definitely a kinesthetic learner or something like that. So I, I think that's kind of the, the model that has been the most sort of pervasive. Um, but like I said, there, I mean, there's dozens that have, have been identified. Um, and it, you know, it, it gets, it gets a little murky very, very fast. Um, but the sort of like the general idea is people learn best in a certain way. So visual learners learn best with lots of visual stimulation. Uh, visual representation of information, auditory, they need to hear in order to learn best, um, and so on, sort of down, down the line. Yeah, I, I think. I, it's funny, I, I think I've always kind of identified as a um, visual learner, um, but at, now after reading your post, I kind of, I think I, I think I have a hypothesis about like why I identified that way, but it does it's not about learning styles. It's really like, it really has more to do with the fact that, um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll explain more later, but like, but it, sure. but it was it, like, it was interesting, like reading your post, like challenged my assumption that, 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 that is a, a long held belief that I have had. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember when my daughter was in preschool, like they brought in like an, an, an expert educator to like talk to all the parents and, you know, like he, he, he had an in-depth discussion about learning styles and, um, and yeah, and like, I just, I remember, and now I think back on it, I'm like, wow, they made a really big deal out of that. And now mm -hmm. that I've seen some of the research that you referenced in the post, uh, I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So well, let me ask you more about, okay, so uh, that's me. I shared my experience, like in parenting, like even as recent as when my kids were in preschool. Um, mm -hmm. But what was your experience like as like when you were growing up in the 90s and you were a student and like, you know, the teachers would try to do lessons based on learning styles. Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, I, I wrote about this because I remembered it so vividly. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, photo bomb. My daughter just got home from school. <laughs> hey, welcome home. Uh, yeah, so um, 
I, I mean, I think you could probably find, you know, some reference to something that either is identified as a learning style or sort of has that kind of vibe going back decades and decades and decades. Um, but the, uh, you know, I think the, the real like sort of wave in education, it came in the 90s that it was sort of like every professional development seminar, um, you know, every big initiative, it was something about learning styles. And I remember, you know, very clearly that at the beginning of the school year, um, you know, this was like still an analog time. So there was no Google Classroom. Um, you know, the teachers, they had, um, you know, these like little, it was like a little quiz. And you would, it usually is, you know, like A, B, C, maybe D, if we're doing four learning styles, maybe A, B, C, or the choices if there was only three. And you sort of went through and then you, you sort of like, you know, counted how many A's you circled, how many B's, and then it would tell you at the end, like, okay, if you chose at least eight out of 10 A answers, um, a on this quiz and you're congratulations you're a visual learner and you know we were supposed to you know somehow absorb this information and use it to inform how we studied so if you find out that you're a visual learner then I, you know do one of those mind maps to study something like that right um, and you know the teachers were you know, very enthusiastic about it. Um, and, and they would often sort of preface this because they had done the training and say, okay, well, I'm a, a visual learner. Um, and that means that, you know, it's better for me to listen to a lecture than read a book or, or, or whatever example they ended up giving. Um, but I think this was also, you know, this at this point, I think somebody who's sort of, you know, research minded should start thinking like, okay, what's going on here? Because, you know, God bless them. But, you know, we would take different quizzes in the different classes. And, you know, maybe not everybody was like me. Of course, not everybody was like me. But I did also remember that you know, depending on my mood or whatever, you know, some days they would say definitely a visual learner, some days definitely reading and writing, or if like the, the, the quiz model sort of if it had reading and writing, then okay, it would be that. So there wasn't, you know, you would need consistency. In order for this theory to really be coherent, you would have to have consistency, you know, for a particular learner that they would sort of fit that paradigm 100% of the time. And, you know, even if you're just like a dumb kid, you can, you can see like, huh, so, some days I'm obviously a visual learner and some days I'm obviously an, an auditory learner, like what's going on here? Uh, if it's if it can be different, then you know something's not quite hanging together. Yeah. So, um, but I, you know, it was it was fun, right? <laughs> like, and I, well, it was I like it's like oh, an, another analog thing, but like you know, like magazines used to have quizzes, I, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You you know. Um, I mean, it's like the sorting hat for Harry Potter. Like, I, I guess I'm sort of like exactly the wrong age to have read Harry Potter. Because um, I was I too old when it came out and then too young to just sort of read it anyway. So, but I like, I know what it is. And that idea of being able to like grab some identity marker, um, it's very, very appealing. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Well, it, it, um, I mean, part of it, I, I may be jumping ahead a little bit, but like in the post that like you talk about, like, like for, as a student, like it made you feel seen. It made you feel like yeah, the teacher yeah. was paying attention to you and wanted mm -hmm. to make things personalized for you. And mm 
that's that's a positive thing. I mean, we, like, we've written on the we've had posts on the blog about like personalized learning. Like you know, like so if you're recommending books to a kid, like and you find out that oh they love the Middle Ages or something or mm -hmm. they love fairy tales, like great, you know, then steer them towards those books. As long as the Lexile score is in the right range, you're good to go. You know, it might as well be or like my son who's like all nonfiction all the time, right? He mm -hmm. wants to read about aliens. He wants to read about Chernobyl. Like you know, great. Like you know, get them get them what they're interested in. It gets it makes them more engaged. So it's like. That, that makes sense right sounds good yeah uh, yeah I'm, absolutely and yeah and I, I remember like you know to, to sort of like to your point like about feeling sort of seen I suppose was I you know I can I can picture not all my teachers but a few of them and sort of like what they said about themselves and how how they learn and sort of connecting that and um and you know it's not a, it's not a bad thing to to find a sense of of commonality with with the teacher because i mean it, like that's frankly the most essential part of the human experience right in some ways the teachers are being vulnerable because they're, if they're saying mm -hmm. well i'm stronger at this and weaker at this yes. like they're acknowledging that they're not perfect they don't know everything they have weaknesses and that that's a lot more relatable than just like you know i'm up here on a pedestal and you have to do exactly what i say <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah because they had i mean they basically had to admit um and then this is also kind of like why it's sort of like this kind of uh, really at the end of the day sort of a murky idea is because it, it was all sort of bound up in the idea of also kind of like your strengths. And like, I think that's kind of like why it appealed to people is because, well, we could all sort of say, yes, I have, um, I'm good at this, I'm bad at that. And then and again, sort of mapping it onto this idea of a learning style. Um, yeah, it just sort of made intuitive sense to people. Mm -hmm. But then this, this goes back to like you, you said, like even as a kid, you're like, okay, on some days I answer it, the answer comes out this, and on other days the answer comes out that. And and then like I think you know, researchers are looking at this and be like, okay, is this how is this testable? How do we test this? Because yeah, if it's valid, it has to have consistency, right? Of right. right. So that if, if somebody says these are my strengths, I'm this type of learner, then mm -hmm. do they get better results if the information comes from that way? So um, exactly. Yeah. So, like, so what what did the what did the researchers find when they tried to test the learning styles idea? So there's a lot. So yeah, but basically the idea is, in, in order for this to sort of be valid, uh, you would need to you know first have this like sort of consistency that okay, um, if if we evaluate learning styles that people are a visual learner is always going to be found to be a visual learner. We'll just sort of stick with that example. And then we'd also have to prove that they, they learn better when presented with, let's say information visually. Uh, and, you know, there's, let's see, I, I think the, uh, the the year that I, I could find that was sort of like the watershed year for everybody being like wait a minute <laughs> this <laughs> hold hold your horses there there might not be something right here so that's 2008 um and it was uh Pashler I believe so Pashler 2008 that's kind of the the citation and then there that's some um at, as with all sort of research they always say at the end uh, we need more, we need more research here. And then that kind of kicks on. Uh, but yeah, you, you basically need people to, you know, first identify, okay, visual learner, and then show, okay, this person does retain more information presented visually. Um, this isn't sort of like academic research, but I did find, and it's out there, and I, I wish I could find the link like instantaneously, but I can't. Uh, and it was somebody um, in, you know, a place where there's like a lot of foot traffic, like one of those open air malls or something, probably from the before times when people were still 
gathering in crowds. Um, and he did this sort of like, you know, man, woman on the street test of, of learning styles. And he would ask people, you know, just like when we said, could you go to HEB and tap people on the shoulder? And he, you know, kind of walk up to people and say, all right, so what's your learning style? And, and they would say, okay, I'm a visual learner. And then he would show them, I think it was, he had like picture cards. And then I think he would just say, it was, you know, just like a string of objects. And, and he, people say, I'm a visual learner. And then he'd show them like, look, I showed you all this and you remembered either worse <laughs> or just as well as when I did it, you know, um, just speaking. Like auditory, so yeah. Get, you know, through your ears. Uh, so, so that's, I mean, very simple. And I think his N was, you know, in the video, there's maybe like four people. And that's not, you know, nobody's getting that's a small sample. Like that. yeah. but, uh, but that's kind of like the idea that you go out desert. Okay, so I'm going to present this this way and the other way. Um, and then we can show, you know, people don't actually seem to learn better. Um, but we do see that um, people have a preference for just how they receive information, which doesn't seem to really help, but it's just a preference. Right, right. Uh, and I, I think, yeah, we can, we all have our moments, right, of I can't, <laughs> I can't read another word. Um, but yeah, so, so people do seem to have a, a preference, uh, yeah. but it doesn't really affect if you, so you go back and test later, okay, you know, what did they actually retain from this? But it, it doesn't really seem to help them. Yeah. Although, I mean, I should say that, you know, you can't prove a negative. So we can, we can say it's sort of at this juncture, it's October, 2021. There, it's never been actually proven that, you know, either designing a lesson around a learning style um, or maybe studying, being informed by your learning style. So we, we can't prove that it, it doesn't work, right? We can't prove a negative, but we can say that, all right, there's nothing out there to support. Right, right. Yeah, well, that's a, yeah, that's a that's a cautious way to say it. But um, I think like if if 2008 was when you know this this wave of research you know expressing skepticism about um, learning styles. I mean, now we're in 2021, and I think you were, you quote a, a commentator who says like I'm kind of sick of writing about this. Right? <laughs> then, <you> know, like, <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, well, that actually is. Um, I, I I remember the quote as a cognitive scientist. Uh, and um, I think, no, I can't remember the exact year, but it was, it was like fairly recently um, where there was something that was like, yeah, I, I'm sick of writing about this, that it's, it's been so long and yet it's still sort of like this miasma that hangs over a lot of like schools and then schools of education and even, um, and you know maybe they've gotten rid of it, but even like the test prep materials for teacher licensure exams. Um, but yeah, it's it, you know it. This is there's certainly been a big question mark for 15 years at least, um, probably longer, and it's it's still out there. And, and I I think that. The reason is like, because it's sort of intuitively appealing, right. you know, like just we're, we're all different and it, and it just kind of feels nice to be able to stick a label on that. Uh, and it's, it also feels, you know, from the teaching side, um, it, I think it, it helps teachers and administrators sort of feel like they're doing something to you know address the fact that not everybody's the same right right yeah so like it it like it it feels like it makes sense it feels like it's the right thing to do it's just that 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 pesky research aspect right that there's there's no proof it just proof. That it works so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um but yeah but the, I, like um so one of the things you talk about in the post is that um 
like I think that's that's I think what's so troubling about bad ideas is not so much that they are in themselves destructive, but it's like they take all the oxygen, right? Like they take <laughs> space away from good ideas, like things that actually are proven by research to help people yeah. learn. And so it's like, you know, like if there's a finite amount of time, you know, that schools of ed have to prepare teachers, it's like they should be spending their time on research-based things that actually work, right? Mm -hmm. Like like the earlier post you wrote about like, you know, using uh, phonemic awareness to, you know, mm -hmm. introduce kids to reading, you know, like that makes a big difference in how successful kids are in reading. So uh, my plea to schools of ed is like, please spend more time talking about <laughs> phonics and the science of reading and please Spend less time on learning styles, <laughs> even though it sounds good. Right? Um, yeah. Right. But what are, what are what are some in the post? Like you talk about like some of the, you know, things that that are proven by research, right? Like so, like especially for young kids, right? Like class size makes a difference, right? Right. Uh, yeah. So I mean, I work mostly with young children, so that's kind of you know, um, sort of my bailiwick as as it were, um, and, um. Uh, Again, I, I think sort of the intuitive appeal of this theory is that it, it's, it sort of sells itself as like, you know, a way to really get to know your students and to know something important about them. Uh, you know, it's just the devil's in the details. Uh, and it is fairly consistently shown that, um, that having a good relationship with the the teacher is incredibly important for for student outcomes uh, you know particularly with young children um that is always sort of in that top like sort of two or three factors that can tell you something about uh you know whether the child is is going to have um, positive outcomes from attending a particular program and that sort of like you know did this child have a positive relationship with with their teacher um and this is of course true for the later grades and i wish mm -hmm. i again had this at my fingertips but they you know they have shown things that um you know it, it can sort of make or break a year or two of education yeah. having yeah. that positive relationship with the teacher um it helps for the the teachers to know their students well uh and i think again particularly with young and younger children uh it's easier to do that if you have smaller class sizes like the the, the class size issue it's also uh i think there is a lot of nuance there you know especially depending on the age of the children um but it just is like sort of a practical idea um if you have to i mean even remember is it easier to remember 30 names or 12 <laughs> right and then the parents like who are the pets at home you know like <laughs> i know you know one of my students i know that tootsie and misha are her dogs and that's a lot easier to do that if if, if there's just you know fewer people um and of course tootsie is just a great name for a little, a little dog uh, so uh we are pretty confident again you know based on research that okay that teacher relationship um does seem to be important and you know you really can't get there unless you have time right yeah time with those yeah. students like that's the um the big factor yeah, and there's there's kind of an element of, at least for like one one of the pluses of you know being a blogger and doing this for ten years is I've been in a lot of classrooms by now, um, especially and it's I'm glad that you know things are schools are letting me back on campus again, which I love. So I've been able to visit some classes and I you know I try to watch like you know like how are the parent how are the teachers and the students engaging with each other and um, mm -hmm. you know if I'm lucky I can spend a few minutes and kind of watch like you know like how like how are the teachers like are they cold calling on students like are they you know how do they get feedback from the students like how do they reinforce like when a student gets something right and like there's kind of an, an art to it you know like like the teachers who really got it you know like how they um you know but it like it, it has to there have to be like these multiple touches kind of over time and mm -hmm. i think that's part of like you know this like relationship building that happens um between the teachers and the students i think it is something that um like i think i think at successful schools 
um, you know, they have like some kind of system where like a principal or like a, a master teacher will like observe and kind of give feedback on like, you know, oh, this is how you're relating to the students. And um, I don't know, like, I, I, again, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a teacher. I'm not, I've never been trained in education, but I, but I have been able to visit a lot of classrooms and I, I try to look for like, you know, what are the teachers doing like to engage with the students and, um, you know, just make sure, make sure the students are, you know, they're thinking about what, what the teacher wants them to be thinking about. They're not just like daydreaming or, um, you know, kind of drifting off. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think uh, you, I think you use the word sort of like art. Um, and I, you know, I always find myself, you know, saying like, well, what does the research say? Uh, and I, um, you know, I, I, I guess you can tell that I'm a very skeptical person and I always, you know, think like, all right, show me the data. Um, and, you know, I think really where the true sort of, the true beauty lies in like understanding teaching as a craft. Like, I think it's, it's sort of somewhere in the middle um, because research is research. And, you know, again, sort of one of these big problems, um, you know, facing the, the profession is that kind of disconnect between, you know, good high quality research that goes on and then just sort of like the practical realities of being in a classroom all day. And, you know, people in those two spaces, they don't really talk to each other. <laughs> um, and then, you know, yeah, you start, it is an art. Um, I, I think that, however, just the idea of a craft, um, you know, speaks to the fact that it's something that we do have to do sort of like over and over and over again to get better at. Um, and it's, it is creative in the sense that you are making something. Um, but, you know, we're, I think the, the artist is often sort of a solitary figure, right. sort of, sort of, you know, enacting their own vision and, you know, the, the craftsperson, you know, they have to, they're, they're, they're part of a tradition. Right. Right. It's iterative yeah. that, and every time you get better at it and you can learn. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of like forward. yeah, the metaphor that I, I think of. And I think, yeah, be developing relationships with people to sort of like get back to the original point. Uh, you know, I think it is something that we can get better at. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, because really, we, you know, we do only have just a limited amount of time to, to get to know people, but we don't have to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I, that's what, like, yeah, what, like, it's not an easy task. Um, and that, I think that's what's so dangerous about the learning styles idea is that it, it makes it yeah. sound so, so appealing and so simple. But mm -hmm. if it's not backed by research, then, you know, we don't know that it's helping anything and it may actually be distracting. Right um from yeah. things so like if you know if there you know there's only a certain number of hours for professional development every year you know wouldn't it be better you know to have maybe have a master teacher come in and say here's how to build relationships with your students um mm -hmm. you know spend yeah. time on that you know and let let you know have teachers improve in their craft rather than spending time on an idea that that feels great but is not backed by research yeah, and it really, and, and time just sort of like gets to the heart of the matter, because I, I, you know, I worked for a school, and um, I mean, this was a while ago, so maybe they've changed, but um, and we'll be anonymous. Uh, but like, sort of the lesson plan template, you know, it had like a little section that was like, um, how can you modify this lesson for, and then it, I think it was like visual, auditory, kinesthetic. So, you know, every time a teacher goes to plan a lesson at this school at that time, you know, you had to think about, okay, well, how can I, how can I modify this lesson? And I'm sure there are people who could just crank that out in five, 10 minutes but 
that's still, you know, multiplied over however many lessons throughout the years. And, you know, it is, even if you're just incredibly efficient, it's still, it's just a lot of time. And then professional development, um, uh, I, again, I wish I had the citation sort of at my fingertips, but, you know, it's, it is a pretty well known that most of the time, you know, teachers don't get to choose what professional um, development they they do. And I, you know, bef before we um, went on on online, you know, we were talking about your professional development and what you chose, right? So, right, right. And uh, and again, I'm sure all industries are are different, um, but you know, not only are most teachers um, are they, they're not allowed to choose but you know they could get stuck you know just really wasting their time in something that is not it just yeah is just isn't supported right right yeah yeah well and um i mean you know talking about the importance of relationship building like you know how hard i mean that that's very very hard to do on this for distance learning Right. And, and now yeah. like kids are coming back on campus, but some of them have been at home for a long time. And like, mm -hmm. they're used to just either being by themselves or being with siblings or being with family members. And like, you mm -hmm. know, they don't have experience with non-family member adults. They don't have experience being in a room with kids who aren't relatives. <laughs> like, and so, I mean, it's just going to yeah. be that much harder, you know, for teachers who are trying their best to do relationship building, um, you know, but it's, it's gotta be just like another, um, you know, kind of lingering effect of the pandemic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, yeah, one of those sort of hidden factors that, you know, not only do we know, okay, I mean, they're just atrocious numbers. I haven't, nothing's crossed my desk for Texas recently, um, but I grew up in New England. So, uh, you know, I've seen, I think it was Rhode Island, just atrocious numbers for math and reading on grade level and you know that's just you know the real obvious things that we can test for so yeah we we have these knock-on effects of um children needing real help with the the socialization and anytime i see a data set like that i would say well that's the data for the kids who showed up for the test so what if you include the kids <laughs> yeah. who didn't show up for the test like uh yeah that's a good point. That's, that's, that's there's that's a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we can just keep fighting the good fight for research-based education strategy, right? That's <laughs> yeah. And hey, it's you know it is very hard. Uh, you know, and for a lot of reasons. Um, we you know this is a very you know we don't keep bankers hours. <laughs> 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 in schools uh i everybody is pressed for time and then you know anything that again has that sort of like intuitive appeal it's just going to sort of spread like like wildfire um and you know the pushback against that you know like i mentioned um you, you know if, if, if you're if you're looking up the a study from 2008 how are you going to do that? Practically, you yeah. know, most people just do not have access to this. Yeah, um, I know. I've, I've, I daydream about like, is there any place, university where I can become an adjunct just so I have access to a good research library? Because <laughs> like, I miss it. Like, I miss like, you know, like when I was on Law Review and I could, I had all of UT at my fingertips and like, I miss it. And, but, but I mean, those journals, and that was 20 years ago. I mean, journals have gotten just prohibitively expensive since then. Like yes. it is so out of reach. Like it's impossible. Yeah, and absolutely nobody yeah. is going to be subscribing to those things for fun. No. no. Um, but I have found, uh, and I have not done this a lot, uh, but I, I can certainly say that I've done this. Uh, if something does sort of cross your desk and this goes for anybody out there and you know, you see like, you know, cotton comma Inga, 2021 email her like people will email you copies of their research papers wow 
and you don't know really because you're a member of the public who's asking to read it, they're pretty excited, you know? <laughs> So uh, they'll, they'll send it to you for free. And, the, you, you know, you might have to say something like a draft or whatever, but it's, you know, these things, they go through tiny little revisions where you've got to like, um, you know, capitalize something that you didn't capitalize or, or blah, blah, blah. Um, and that doesn't really matter, but um, for, for sort of your kind of, purposes but yeah so if if any if any teacher or parent if you see something and you're like I want to read uh cotton 2021 just just email her and I can almost guarantee that the the professor or researcher will will send you a copy of the paper and you don't have to subscribe to some crazy expensive journal that's a good tip you know um yeah, there's real people. Um, and I know for myself as a writer, like I, I want people to read my stuff. Now I have the luxury of, you know, having a grant funded nonprofit so I can publish this stuff. Um, you know, but I can I can see how the yeah, like yeah, academics like I mean they they love what they do, they care about what they do, and they want um their ideas to have influence. So um yeah, that's a good tip. Yeah, thank goodness for the internet where you can actually find people's contact information that way. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if they're connected with a university, you know, it's pretty easy to sort of navigate your way to an email address. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, okay. Well, that's good. That's a good action. I, I get, so I always like to, as we, as we kind of wrap up, I want to make sure that folks know how to track down um, international school of San Antonio. And so mm -hmm. can you, you talk about like, like which grades you serve and um, which, which languages? Cause I think that's one of the, the really unique things about the program is like, you know, helping kids be multilingual and, um, and you guys have a bigger portfolio of languages represented than just about any school in town that I know of. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, so yeah, um, all good questions. Uh, so yeah, you're, you're right. Um, we are a language immersion program. Um, and I think that's sort of like how I ended up, you know, r really pursuing these other other threads is because, you know, language is one of those things where people have a lot of sort of like intuitive ideas that aren't really grounded in anything. And, you know, especially in sort of like my early, early days, like I, I had to spend a lot of time, uh, you know, explaining to people like, okay, I know it seems like, you know, language acquisition happens this way, but it's really this. And, you know, we can know that based on experiments. Uh, so our school, um, we serve right now students in pre-K and kindergarten, and we will so we're uh, two years old. So we will add grades sort of as everybody ages. And we have immersion in French, Spanish, and Mandarin Chinese. Uh, and then we have Saturday classes that are for students ages three to 12. And then on Saturdays, we have again, French, Spanish, Mandarin, Chinese. And then we also offer Russian. Uh, we do, I guess summer's over. <laughs> Um, but we do, we also do summer camps um, as well. Did yeah. I cover everything? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just it's it's so cool. Well, and uh, you know, I just encourage everybody to you know follow you on social media because you guys do a great job of like storytelling through social media of like the fun events and like things that kids get to oh, do. So it's like you know, like like um, so like they're learning language, but they're also cooking, you know, or they're learning about mm -hmm. travel and they're learning about different holidays and you know. So I mean, there's always yeah, there's always like so much, there's so much discovery to it. Like it's not just you know the language acquisition, but it's it's like it's cultural and mm -hmm. they're they're using the language to these different activities. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, absolutely, um, because you know. They really are two sides of the same coin, language and culture. Um, and you know, I I sort of I sort of joke that you know be, because we have you know sort of our three main languages during the week, and then we um, have the additional language of Russian on the weekends. That you know we could be celebrating a holiday every other day. So, you know, there's 15 Spanish speaking countries. So <laughs> really, we, 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 we have to edit it a little bit so that it's not, you know, constantly uh, a party, but it is, you know, because really at the end of the day, you know, 
if you don't understand the culture, communication's not going to happen. And then what's the point? So we, we right. do it, make sure that the, the kids are really exposed to, you know, the people and the customs from the countries where our languages are spoken. And I've certainly, you know, had the experience of, you know, being with, um, you know, people um, back, back in the days of international travel, uh, you know, being like in China was either, you know, somebody who had a very high level for whatever reason. And, you know, they would often just be totally baffled by, you know, what was going on because they, you know, they didn't learn, um, didn't learn those details. And really, you know, it makes a difference. And, you know, through my, my career, I've also encountered people who, you know, maybe their language skills aren't great, but they really get it culturally and tend to actually be pretty successful. You just bring your translator along for the ride. Um, and, you know, as long as you show that you're, you're not, not totally ignorant, then, you know, people will think you're, you're okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, language, could, it could, it's a gateway to understand other cultures, but like learning, appreciating the other cultures is what brings language to life so that you can actually like function with it. And it's not just, Absolutely. you know, tapping along on Duolingo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Du Duolingo is kind of my nemesis. <laughs> I mean, I, I know a lot of people use it and it's, it's sort of, yeah, entertaining to, to tap around during breaks or whatever. But I, you know, I always say like, mm, that's not really going to do as much as you think it will. <laughs> God, yeah. God bless the, the developers over at Duolingo. Uh, yeah. But really nothing beats immersion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, having to like listen, process, think, interact, and feeling motivated to connect, like that's uh -huh. yeah, yeah, and how fun to do that with with young kids so that they can it can feel yes. natural to them. Yeah, oh, it feels so natural to them. Yeah, well, that's wonderful. I it, I always I always learn so much from talking to you, and I'm really grateful to have the guest post on the blog. And um, for anyone who's like stumbling across the video first, click on the description in the the link and that will take you to the whole blog post and um it, it, that, that's got links to the research that, that mary referred to and including the cognitive scientists who are tired of explaining <laughs> that learning styles are not backed up by research but uh we will add our voices to the chorus and saying please stop focusing on learning styles spend your time on research-based interventions like small class sizes for young children and building relationships with your students <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, and and like I said, you know, I, I, this is, you know, it's a tough road to hoe to, to be in education. And, um, you know, when something like this comes along, it's, you know, it is just so appealing. It's like, oh, yeah, just like one weird trick that you can use to, <laughs> to make your life easier. And <laughs> often the alternative you know, like what I am sort of suggesting, like that's really hard to say like, oh, you need to have a deep seated positive relationship with all of your students. Like, I understand that. Like that's, that's a big ask. It is. Um, but I guess at, at the end of the day, um, you know, we have to go with, you know, working, working with what's supported with, with real research. Like, um, Otherwise, we're just sort of groping around in the dark, and I don't think we really get anywhere doing that. No, no. I think if we've, if we've learned anything from the past few years, it's that focusing on truth and science and good research methods is what's going to get us mm -hmm. towards the light. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it, you know, it is hard. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, great. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Hours. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've really enjoyed discussing learning styles and. Um, so let's, let's close out this video and then I, I have a few more questions for you off air, so. Okay, sure, right. no problem. Well, it's a pleasure as always.